Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. I hope you are well. In the news right now, we have gone from the ridiculous to the completely absurd. The experts, quote unquote, were saying back in 2020 that we should pay people to stay at home. We should give them stimmy checks. We have to do this to support the economy because 70% of our economy is demand. It's consumer spending. So if we don't give people free money or dollars, stimmy checks from Janet Yellen and the Treasury, then our economy is going to implode. So we have to do the right thing and pay people to stay home. We have to set up this incentive structure where the government is competing with employers for actual employees. And we can see now in the data with all the labor shortages, we now know who won that battle. It was the government. But we've gone from something that was a stupid idea to begin with that caused all of these economic distortions to now a proposal or quote unquote solution that will obviously make things even worse. And what's unbelievable to me is that these central planners never think about unintended consequences. It's absolutely staggering. They can sit there and say, oh, we'll just pay people to stay home. And they don't think, well, what is that going to do later on? It goes back to Henry Hazlitt. Right there, economics in one lesson. The fallacy of overlooking secondary consequences. It's human nature, but it's it's not just human nature. When we look at it through the political lens, the politicians do this at a level that's far greater than the average of the society at large. So if we have the tendency as human beings to never consider secondary consequences, the politicians have taken that part of their brain and they've gotten a full lobotomy. It doesn't even exist. They don't have the ability to think past their nose. And this is a fantastic example of that. So let's get into the article. The crisis in the economy, the government should pay people to go back to work, says Barry Sternlicht. So Mr. Sternlicht is saying there's a shrinking U.S. workforce during the Cervasa sickness. Why is that, Barry? Let's start there. So what he's trying to do is fast forward to the middle of the story to try to find the solution. No, 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 no. We've got to look at the whole entire story, how this played out right from the beginning. So the shrinking workforce due to government intervention and paying people to stay home, that's what this should say. That's what hampered the American economic recovery. He is the founder of Starwood Capital, which operates hotels. Okay, fine. The whole service economy is in a crisis, he said. The country can't really work without its service people back. I completely agree. But Barry, why are we in this dilemma? We're here because the government paid people more than they were making at work with their employer. And now that they have this savings that was due to not only that, but not having to pay their rent, not having to pay their mortgage, and now they're getting a child tax credit, which is basically another stimmy check, and their home equity due to government regulations restricting additional supply of housing to come online, has gone up through the roof, no pun intended. So why on earth should they go back to work, especially when their employer that they've been so loyal to is forcing them to inject a foreign substance into their body, basically giving them the middle finger saying, we don't care about you. We don't care about your years of loyalty. And we don't care about how much profit and productivity you have brought into this business. And you know, that's really the theme with the majority of the videos that I've been doing over the past few weeks. It's that the mainstream media, the experts, these people in their ivory tower, the politicians, the central planners, they just don't get it. And either they're, they're not seeing the obvious 
They're not seeing the unintended consequences of their policies, or they do understand, and they're just not willing to admit it. Probably the latter. So this gentleman, again, Starwood, okay, great. He says the federal government should pay people to go back to work. So we, it, it's obvious the negative impact that paying people to stay home in the first place had on our economy. How can we come to the conclusion that by doing more of that, but just in a different way, isn't going to have any negative economic impact. And in fact, it'll solve all of our problems. And just to expand on that, what are these people going to do? They're going to say, oh my gosh, you're going to pay me $5,000 to go back to work? Fantastic. They're there for a month and they're like, okay, bye-bye, I'm gone. Thanks for that five grand though. I mean, come on. How this, Again, this stuff would be obvious to a third grader. How is this not obvious to the quote unquote experts? The government, which has spent trillions of dollars to help unemployed people and struggling businesses. Okay, so is it the government that spent that? Or is that the poor and middle class? The government doesn't have any money to spend. It can only spend what it extracts. So, or well, let me take that back. It can only expend what it extracts or what is purchased by the Federal Reserve. In which case, it's creating more dollars circulating in the real economy and the balance sheets of the non-bank entities chasing goods and services. So the government can, own, I think, set a better way. The government can only spend what it spend what it extracts directly or what it extracts as far as purchasing power through current and future rates of consumer price inflation. That's the only thing the government can do. And if it's not extracting it directly through taxation or by selling those bonds directly to the uh, the entities and individuals in the real economy, and if they're doing it through just straight inflation, increasing the money supply, which is what happens when the Fed monetizes debt, that is disproportionately affecting the poor and middle class. So basically what they're, de what they're doing, let, let me read this again in the way that presents it accurately. The government, which has spent trillions of dollars, which it stole from the poor and middle class to help unemployed people and struggling businesses. So again, the arsonist is the firefighter. They are taking purchasing power away from the poor and middle class because they want to give it to the poor and middle class. So on net balance, they're, they're, this is not a solution. In fact, giving them the benefit of the doubt this is just, there, there is no impact negatively on the real economy. That's giving them the benefit of the doubt. But in reality, this is going to, this has and will continue to have a huge negative impact on the real economy, the average Joe and Jane, but yet the politicians can sit back like they're the heroes. Well, we solved the problem. We stood up for the little guy. But of course, what they're not telling you is we stole everything from the little guy to give it to the little guy. And therefore we claim that we are the solution. We are the firefighter. And if people don't scratch beneath the surface, if they don't peel back the layer of the onion and all you do is watch CNN, then you take these politicians at their word. And you believe that they're truly trying to help the poor and middle class instead of just simply buying votes. And here he says they should actually pay people a bonus for going back to work and getting back into the labor force off federal programs and state programs. <laughs> it's, it's almost like these people are oblivious to the words that are actually coming out of their mouth. 
Like they can't hear what they're saying. How could you be that obtuse? How can you be this dense? You're saying that the problem is government intervention and government paying people to stay home. So the solution is obviously more of the same. I mean, again, I get it. It's a little bit different. But what I would argue is that it's still going to have unintended consequences. Those unintended consequences are just going to be a little bit different. And at the end of the day, when the smoke settles, we're going to be in the exact same position we're in now, with the exception of the fact that we've had to deficit spend even further, create more monetary inflation, which is going to damage not only today's economy, but the economy that our kids and grandkids are going to have to live with in the decades to come. Any super chats, Josh? All right. You're a true gem on YouTube. Well, thank you very much, Noel. I, I appreciate that. We're really doing our best to create as much content to point out the insanity in the world and really stand up and fight for freedom and free market economics. But just like I, I said on this video, it's it's not just about us. We've, we've got to stand up and have a sense of urgency and we've got to fight for freedom for our kids and our grandkids here. That That's really what's at stake. And I know it sounds like I'm using hyperbole all the time, but just look at what's happening in Australia. Use that as an example. I mean, go back to 2019. If I would have said to you, every single person on this live stream right now, if I would have said, do you think Australia is just as free as the United States? I mean, pretty much on par. You probably would have said, yeah, for the most part, they might not have the Second Amendment. They might not allow their citizens to have guns. But I mean, if I go to Sydney, Australia or Melbourne, it's going to be very similar from a standpoint of freedom and liberty. It's a, a, a typical Western city, just like San Francisco or Miami or Dallas, anything like that. That was a, just a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, you would have said that Australia was very similar to the United States. And look where they are now. The entire East Coast, at least the major cities, are in complete lockdown, where they only allow them to leave their house one hour a day. In Melbourne, I read reports saying that they have been in lockdown there for over 200 days straight. Think about what that does to kids. Look at all the protests down there and look at what they're doing to people. In fact, if you follow me on Twitter, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Where the police are literally showing up at people's doors in Australia. This is happening right now. And they're saying, did you make this post on Facebook? Because if so, you're in big, big trouble. And the post on Facebook is basically something stating that they're for freedom. That's where they are in Australia. I mean, when I use the words totalitarian police state, I am not exaggerating one bit. And now they can't even leave the country without specific permission. And yet the people over there in Perth are saying, oh, well, that's no big deal. I mean, the bars and the restaurants, they're all open hair. So what do we care? Right. Were the bars and restaurants open in East Germany? They were. But you had that little inconvenience of the Berlin Wall that trapped you inside. So were you really free? I don't think so. And I'd also like to point out that even... In East Germany, when they had the Berlin Wall, they could go outside for more than an hour a day. So you see my point? That's why I'm doing three, four, five, six videos a day to try to open up people's eyes that we are on the road to serfdom. And, if it, and it's up to us to get off this path this road to hell that's paved with good intentions. And at the end of the day, we have the power to do it.
because there's more of us than there is of them. Bottom line. And my good buddy, Gerald Salente, told me the story of how the Berlin Wall came down. You had thousands of Germans who had had enough. They had had enough of this authoritarianism. And they valued freedom more than they valued safety. They went out to that wall, then thousands more and thousands more and thousands more until the guards could do nothing but put down their guns. And the whole wall came down. You'll notice that when you study history, the groups, the individuals that value freedom more than they value safety are always on the right side of history. And it's gonna be the exact same thing in 2021. So that's why I'm, I've made such an effort on this Rebel Capitalist channel. And I hope that all of you will join me in standing up and having that sense of urgency and fighting for freedom, not only for us, but for the generations to come, our kids and grandkids. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, guys. We'll see you on the next video.